Well, it's uh, it's a bit lighter out here. Welcome to Alaska. Thanks for joining me. Snow's pretty deep. Only reason I'm able to ride is there's hard pack underneath. And I'm going through powder. Yeehaw! Thank you for joining me today. As you can see, it's just all the trees are flocked with snow. It's beautiful. All right, I'll get right back with you. Hey, good morning. Thanks for joining me. Uh, beautiful day in Alaska. Here, I'll give you a quick panoramic of what I'm looking at here. As you can see behind me, just uh, snow flock trees. The sun's coming up, obviously, over there. And uh, we're in this little, little gravel pit. The snow is, eh. A lot of what's right here, I kind of fluffed out of the way, ripping by, but you know it's alaska it snows it's what it's doing what it's supposed to do so uh what i wanted to share with you today uh first and foremost i think i said september 15th it's december 15th this friday uh, 7 p.m pacific time for uh, night dreams radio uh, talk radio uh again there'll be a link in the description and uh y'all are welcome to join me there it'll be free there's a, a plow going down the road. Scraping like hell. Sorry, it'll it'll be past in just a minute. Here, let me give you a look here. Just spitting that snow over the edge there. So they go in twos, one hits the center and then the other one hits the edge, so it's pushing it constantly off the road, if you were curious. Ah, I figured I'd share that. All right. So, what I wanted to share with you today comes from a retired bush pilot, Craig. Um, this experience he thought he was gonna take to his grave because he didn't, the people he initially shared with back in 1983, uh, fellow bush pilots and whatnot only a couple of them were receptive and the overall vibe was you know eh, keep that down you don't want to lose your pilot's license over over that so and you know uh, up here when you're a bush pilot reputation is everything you know uh, especially in those circles um I, i'm not in that circle so i, I couldn't tell you who were the reputable uh, reputable ones at this time because there's so many air services that have sparked up over since 1983 um <laughs> but we'll leave it at that so you know uh he had spoke to one of his friends after it had happened and his friend relayed a couple things that made him feel a little better but he still just just packed it away and you know he retired some years ago now uh lives in a warmer climate uh loves alaska uh he shared photos and everything like that but he wants to remain anonymous so that those are for my viewing only but um, not not of this incident. Uh, he didn't have a camera or anything. All he had with him was a uh, a shotgun and some. Uh, it was like a, a 22 uh, little six shot Ruger um, single six. That's what it was. So and he was basically out flying around. He had had he had landed in Dillingham, refueled. He had time before he had to fly back up to New Shigak and pick up some clients and then bring them back to Dillingham Airport. So as he was just kind of killing a little bit of time, he decided to circle around. So he left Dillingham Airport, started flying due east back towards the New Shigak River, and he saw the uh, 
Lowitla River, which is uh, the headwaters in between these two small little dome-like mountains. Uh, I don't know if they're tall enough to be mountains, but I think they're marked that. But it ends in there, and he noticed a little valley in there that was just beautiful. So he made a mental note, hey, I want to check that place out. Uh, he had been flying in the area for a couple years, but it's, it was all a grind. He was just going here to there, here to there. He wasn't... He didn't have a whole lot of free time because the season was short and he was trying to pack in as much money as he could. So he was actually going to have some free time because they were free of clients. So he did his job. He went up New Stew, picked up the people, and then flew them to Dillingham Airport, dropped them off, uh, grabbed a little more fuel, took off. He was in a little Piper Cub. So uh, he takes off, and anyone wor uh, wondering how, how he carried two people, well, he was able to carry two people in their two backpacks. That's all he had room for in that little Piper Cub. He wasn't like packing, you know, a bunch of gear or anything like that. That was coming down in the skiff, but the guys that were there had a flight to catch. So they just, you know, had personal bags in themselves and got out of there. Anyway, so he takes care of business and there's still about, you know, dang, eight hours of daylight left. So he heads over to the Lewitla and as he's circling around, he's got tundra tires on and stuff, so he's looking for a little place to land, and he searches for a little while and finally finds a nice little spot. And so he's basically facing due north at this spot, right next to it's basically a creek at that point. Uh, it's just not, not that far away from him. And so he decides, I'm going to go hike up onto that little dome-shaped kind of mountain over there off to my right and just take a look around. Well... So he has his shotgun. Uh, he makes sure he has extra ammo for his 22 and all that. Uh, grabbed a little day pack. Had himself a little lunch earlier in the day, but he also had some survival food in case he had to camp out overnight. And he left his Piper Cub. And he, was, he said he got about a mile into this hike. And as he was going along, he broke through some uh, willows and alder brush and he came out onto a little patch of tundra as it was starting to gain elevation on this little mound. So he's kind of looking and he's like, ah, I don't want to hike up right here. I'll circle around and find a little bit of a gully and just go up that and, you know, take a look around like that. So he continues around heading due north, basically, kind of wrapping around this little, this little mountain. He said he got about halfway to where he had visualized cutting up to and he took a break and he started eating his lunch. Now, he's just above the willow line. You know, there wasn't a lot of huge trees out that way. Uh, a few black spruce here and there, but it was mainly alders and willows and, and scrub brush and berry, and berry brush. And he was just above it uh, to where he was free and clear of any obstruction, and he's looking down into the vegetation. He said that as he was sitting there, he was trying to figure out how long he wanted to stay because he had already you know he was didn't have a whole lot of daylight left he had been almost three hours into this because of the grueling hike it was far more than he had anticipated from the air and so he decides i'm gonna go a little further and then i'll turn back so he commences to enjoying his lunch and uh, it was a late lunch and from what he was saying he kept hearing a very loud squirrel uh, he said the squirrel noise was so, it was unreal. He was like, this has got to be a, re a world record squirrel. If I see it, I'm going to shoot it with my 22 and show people, look at the size of the squirrels up here in Alaska, right? So he's he keeps looking around for the origin of this squirrel sound, you know, just a chatter. Chee -chee 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 -chee. And as it's going on and he stands up, he's looking around. He's kind of enjoying his sandwich a little bit, just kind of just trying to see if he could put eyes on this squirrel. He notices brown movement, and it was real low to the ground and just out of view because uh, the, the rise kind of fell away from him. So it, whatever was back there was obscured, but he saw a little bit of brown movement. And he was like, okay, the squirrel's over in that direction. Let me finish my sandwich. I'll keep my eyes over that way, and I'll go get the squirrel after I'm done eating. So, and as he's sitting there, he, he started thinking back, and he was like, that squirrel noise is so intense. I, there's no way a little, even if it was a large squirrel the size of a badger, could it be making that loud of a noise? So he started second guessing his thoughts on going after this squirrel. Uh, Craig said as he was sitting there and he just finished up his sandwich and he was putting his little uh, 
little Tupperware dishes and stuff back together, that uh, little backpacker set or whatever into his pack, uh, that's when he heard a click and a pop sound. He said it was just one click, one pop, but it was, it was crisp, it was loud, and it was in quick succession, click pop, click pop. And he was like, what the hell is that? So he starts looking back the direction of his airplane because it sounded almost like something hit his plane. The, the pop sound almost sounded like something whacked into his Piper Cub, right? But it, it was a lot closer. But it, it, just in the moment, it was so odd. He, he looked back and he could barely see his plane through the brush and stuff, but he could see part of it, the white and red Piper Cub. Uh, and he noticed it. it it was all right and that sound happened again off to his right hand side as he's facing on his back trail now as he's facing his back trail all it, it's it's downhill to his right to the brush and that's where he heard it again for the second time but it was it was click pop click pop and then pop 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 click 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 just a weird cadence of clicks and pops and so he's really intrigued he's like what the hell is this you know uh he he wasn't he said he wasn't scared in that moment he was concerned that he couldn't recognize what the sound was so he decides all right i'm gonna i'm gonna walk to the edge of this rise where it drops down into this brush and see if i can get a better bird's eye view because the way it was sloping down there was a horizon line where it dropped down a little further before it started the brush and and he couldn't see past that so he was going to go up to that horizon line there right in front of him and look down into the shrubs and see what the hell so he says he grabs his shotgun, uh, slung his pack on. He, he, again, he wasn't scared at that moment. As he gets up to that edge, up behind him on that mountain he was attempting to climb, up in a little gully, up at the top of it, he saw this black thing. And he said the distance was probably half a mile away, but it was, it was big and black, and he heard a scream. So it caught his attention, and he's like, what the hell is that? Now, as soon as that one screams, on the other mountain, just right, right across the way, not that far, what, 1,500 yards, maybe a little more at, at this point where he was at, there's a, a return scream. It was scream, caught his attention. By the time he was, his head turned to check out the, where the noise was coming from and saw the black figure up there, couldn't make it out, a return scream came from across the way. Initially, he thought... It was an echo because it so happened where those where that other mountain was there was a little ravine and he thought maybe it echoed back right until he saw movement towards the top of that one big and black very large he could not it wasn't a bear and the scream he said was horrifying he, he he's never found anything quite like it air raid siren type murdering a woman type death scream right so he's really perplexed and he's really concerned now um at this portion i will uh edit out my face and put in the maps because uh squash bait said the the beatings will continue until uh morale improves so he'd like to see a better effort on me integrating in the software with my editing which is whatever but uh so i'll show the overall map of uh the bristol bay region because this where he was at was between the mcclung river and the cockwalk river and both those rivers have a history of sightings and this where he was at was dead center you could literally line up so i'll put those in here uh so you guys can see and uh i will i will differentiate the the dots in the middle uh will be him and the two dots opposing him will be where he heard the screams. I'll make sure to label them one and then two. Um, so I'll put those in there. So he recognizes after that second scream, that follow-up scream, and, and sees the dark figure moving. Now, large in comparison to the distance he was looking. You know what I mean? So keep that in mind. Uh, he, he didn't want to guesstimate. I mean, he said it had to have been very very large in order to be that pronounced but it was still not close enough for him to get features or anything else but other than a black dot right and he said he immediately uh, his attention first of all was drawn away from that little ravine a uh, little little drop off where he was going to look into the willows for this clicking and popping sound right all that went out the window with the screams 
So he's totally not even thinking about that as he turns to head on his back trail to go back to his Piper Cub to get out of there because he wanted no part of whatever in the hell was happening. Uh, he said he sensed it had to do with him and he didn't like it. And so he, as he was turning around to go on his back trail, off to his right hand side as he started along before he went down into the willows where he came out of he heard movement in the brush and as he was going along in the uh, along the edge of the brush was about 20 25 feet away not that far he got really concerned because his uh said his spidey senses was going off and he felt in danger at that point so feeling like he was in danger he didn't want to waste any shotgun rounds he thought it might be a bear he pulls out his little 22 single six right start screaming and hollering hey bear 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 he's calling out for bear has no idea what these things are they're far enough away uh where the screams came from that he he's feels he's in a safe distance so he's not panic stricken by anything just yet right but assumes there's a bear over here and so he fires a single shot kind of quasi up in the air just over the brush just to make a, a snapping sound or whatever to to startle this bear out well it startled whatever it was and at that moment he didn't know but it started thrashing in the direction he was heading and not away and he's like crap i just scared it into my path whatever i mean you know he assumed he scared a bear into his path and so he's like crap it's probably going to backtrack right on me he's like you know he was he was kind of beating himself up like yeah smooth move craig and so he puts away his 22 and gets his his shotgun in a ready position pointing down made sure he was ready to go with the slugs and he said something odd happened as he was just getting to the brush line where he would have to duck and push willows out of the way to, to break through because he was smart enough to back mark his trail where he came out of the brush. So he put just a little tie. Uh, it was an old piece of handkerchief. It, it was kind of a, he said it was a horrible choice, but it was red and brown and it kind of blended in perfectly to the, to the area, but he was able to see it because of the way it was moving in the wind. So as soon as he gets to that area and he's untying it, right, he notices something dark just off to his right hand side down in the brush. And he said, he thought black bear. Okay, it's a curious black bear. All right, I'm good. I'm not worried about this black bear because it's gonna make its presence known before I have an opportunity to shoot it. I don't want to, so let me just pick up my pace. He was trying to think logically. He didn't want to hurt animals. He just wanted to go on outside of the squirrel that he had imagined. Well, he continues on down his trail and he keeps us, he's making no qualms about looking over and watching this blackness, it, it, this darkness off into the brush. And it was just out of view to where he couldn't make it out, but he said it looked, it, Initially, he thought it was fur, but every time he was looking, he would look a little longer. He'd take a few steps, look a little longer. He said it looked like black hair. That was about four inches long. And he was like, that's really weird, you know, uh, for a black bear. I wonder if it's, you know, just kind of a holdover gene or something, whatever, because it's, you know, Alaska. Maybe they're a little longer hair and they stay warmer, whatever. He, he didn't know. He said he continued down his trail and he augmented his way back just a bit. He had to make like a, an elongated C off to the left hand side because he said something told him don't continue down his trail. There was no mind speak, it was just something he felt within himself. Change your trail a little bit. And it just so happened there was a game trail on the tundra in between the willows and stuff that he was navigating through to go off to the left just a little bit. And it, he said it was like an elongated C and he said, about halfway through that point which was about 50 yards long before it kind of cut back onto this kind of main game trail he was kind of trekking through he said at the halfway point he heard that squirrel sound again but this time it sounded like it was right on top of him so he turns swings around pulls up the shotgun he's looking he's not seeing it he's looking into the brush he sees darkness down there but he's not seeing really anything he can't make it out so he takes a step back or two and then he notices above the brush, which is well over seven foot where he was standing, he saw shoulders and a head because of the sunlight, right? So he looks up, sees this thing, and he said uh, it had all black skin. Uh, the skin looked really, really tight to the cheekbones, uh, sparse hair around the, uh, the lower part of the jaw, real wide jaw, uh, black eyes, had kind of a quasi pointed head, but looked almost emaciated skinny. Um, he said it, it 
it was making the squirrel sound, looking right at him. He could see its wide mouth just, you know, dee, 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 making this sound. And he yells at it, get out of here, get out of here. It turns and drops down into the brush and he's trying to look into the brush. Now there's leaves and stuff, so he's not seeing much, but he hears it moving away. So he continues down the path. He's like, holy shit. You know, he knew immediately what he was looking at. It was a Bigfoot. He, he didn't realize they had black skin in certain places or whatever. You know, he was only familiar with the paddy footage everyone had seen at that point. And so he was shook. He was like, that's got to be a Bigfoot, you know. And so he picks up his pace and then he's like, well, then the other two dots I must have seen and heard are also Bigfoot. So there's at least three I need to really get moving. I don't know what they're doing. This one seems to be following me. So he continues, he, and he's, he's picked up his pace considerably. He said he fell about three or four times, um, had to stop, take the round out of the chamber of his barrel of his shotgun, take a willow branch and run it down through the action out the end of the barrel to unplug it from the moss a couple times uh, because he was panic-stricken. He was getting the hell out of Dodge. He said when he came out of the game trail, uh, down by basically the, the creek, the upper end of the uh, Lowitla River, uh, the brush got thick again, real, real dense, and he knew that the one part was bigger rocks that he would it, that were slippery that it came up initially. He knew a little further down to his left, there's a more clear way, and he chose that way to go. So he said he cut through the brush, and he got caught up a couple times because it was just, just spaghetti web just laced in there you know all the branches growing every which way it was hard to just push through it was so thick he said he made his way through he lost his hat uh he had uh lost a pair of work gloves out of his back pocket somehow doesn't know how but whatever uh you know he, he was just tabulating after the fact but so he gets out into the clearing there's still brush there's tall grass and stuff around so he's not out of the woods but he's not that far from his plane he can see it and so he has a little bit of relief and he looks up the creek back to the direction where his original trail cut up. He looked back to see how much distance was between where he chose to come out and where he had actually gone up. And he said it was about 20, 25 feet. And he was taking a moment to be proud of himself for recognizing his back trail and stuff, right? The guys will do that every once in a while. But anyway, so as he was having his little moment and looking up that way, he said this thing slid down the rock, came out in the full view, 25 feet away from him. He said it was every bit of nine foot tall, real skinny, and did the squirrel chat. <laughs> Just chattered at him. And at that point, he said he turned the gun and pointed it at it and said, get out of here. He said this thing just looked at him like, what? had this thing obviously had never dealt with firearms before or was not intimidated at all uh he said he wasn't gonna shoot uh he was bluffing and maybe this creature sensed that and was like yeah right you know maybe that was it who knows it's speculation uh he said it stood there and just kept doing that as he continued he started pepping his step getting across there he said when he got up to the piper cub he knew once he fired it up it'd make a lot of noise and that would probably get him to back off right so he makes his way gets up on his back trail and constantly looking behind him this thing he said it stayed right where it slid out onto that creek bed and just kept doing every time he looked at it it would do the squirrel chatter at him real odd didn't try to follow him from that point forth none of that right so he gets in the cub fires it up and as it he's got to let it warm up and get up to operating temperature right so as it's doing that he's angled up you got to understand but he's looking out he had the door open still in the upper window clicked up into place and he's leaning out looking because the direction is just off to his right hand side just underneath his wing off to his right and the thing's standing there he says about 40 yards away at that point and it just was standing there looking at him just kind of giving weird looks like what the hell's that weird noise coming from this thing you know <laughs> he said once he was at operating temperature he gunned up turned around and took off he said once he got airborne and got enough altitude he circled back and came in low real low and it was gone uh, he flew back he, he gained altitude and went up to where he had been can't uh, had stopped for his lunch couldn't see anything circled around to the mountain to the left and 
come back around and he said as he was coming back around he was gaining altitude as he was he was climbing as he circled around that the mountain he chose to look at first where he saw the first scream from and as he came around it he said up in that little that gully going up to that second mountain he said it looked like they reached a rock a small rock face and disappeared into it he and from his vantage point he couldn't see if it was a cave or what but he he saw them all three boom 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 one after the other disappear into this area and he banked and he ended up going uh he was gonna fly up to uh nostuya hawk and decided better of it turned around flew back to dillingham landed uh stayed the night at the bristol inn got a hold of his employer uh figuring out when the next run of of uh clients and stuff would be for the you know the hunting lodge that he happened to be working for at the time and just kept the whole incident to himself um again shared with a couple people and just you know left it at that uh i appreciate him uh i guess his daughter uh fan of the channel pointed him this direction for him to come out and share uh craig is not his real name and uh he's after that point he stayed a bush pilot for many many years he uh he retired back in the uh, around 2006-7 range, somewhere in there, and uh, moved back down south a little about 10 years after that uh, just to get warmer conditions or whatever. I want to thank him for reaching out and not taking his experience to the grave. Um, he said he's probably not going to watch the episode because he, he relives it all the time and doesn't need to hear it. Um, I just, I, if he does watch this, thank you. I, I told him thank you on the phone several times. And also thank you to his daughter. Um, you don't have to dox yourself by responding to people's comments or anything like that. But I just, I appreciate the people that are making the effort to get a hold of these people and get them to share. Uh, who knows who will have that little, little piece of something in an experience that'll make everything else make more sense. Who knows? I mean, it's all a guessing game right now because there's no experts i sure the fuck ain't an expert but anyway uh thank you for joining me let me give you guys a, a little gander it's uh it's got some pink rosy hues over there and uh just a beautiful alaska day it's getting it's getting colder since the cloud cover is leaving so i'm gonna let you guys go so i can warm up thanks again for joining me and again uh don't forget Friday, December 15th, 7 p.m. Pacific Time, uh, Night Dreams Talk Radio. There'll be a link down in the description. Check it out. We'll see you guys there.